Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be talking about the wonderful Apple TV Plus show, Raw. We are joined today by Liz Flayhive, who is the co-showrunner, executive producer, writer, and also director of episode five, The Woman Who Was Fed by a Duck. We have Carly Mensch, who's a co-showrunner, executive producer, and writer on the series. Nicole Kidman, who is in The Woman Who Ate Photographs, and also an executive producer on the series. Cynthia Arrivo, who stars in the episode, The Woman Who Found Bite Marks on Her Skin, Alison Brie, who stars in The Woman Who Solved Her Own Murder, and Merritt Weaver, who stars in The Woman Who Was Fed by a Duck. And Liz and Carly, I wanted to start by talking about the collaboration that you had with a lot of the other writers on the series, because I love that you gave all of them the book, had them read every single one of the stories, and kind of tell you a handful of the stories that really connected to that, that they were interested in potentially fleshing out and telling for the screen. Um, and I was just interested in kind of like where the genesis of that idea and, and that, le that layer of collaboration came from, and how that gave really personalized elements and, and very unique voices to all of the stories. Because even, you know, the, the duck episode with Merritt was one where, you know, you hadn't necessarily seen the initial perspective of a duck giving advice is very toxic and obviously the episode really spawned out of that you know element and so I was interested in in just how that collaboration and that style of approach came about and what really came into a lot of the episodes from it. Sure um, yeah it was a definitely a new process for us and felt kind of organic to the material. Um, it's a heavy lift these episodes you have to do a lot of work in, in 30 pages and um, the stories in the book are really spare. So, so there's a lot of room for a writer to kind of come in, not just flesh it out, but bring a lot of themselves to, to a story. So kind of between knowing it was a heavy lift and that there was a lot of space, it seemed right to us that kind of rather than foisting episodes on writers, our best move was to hand them the book um, and see what they connected to and where you know where their brains went. And it often, in fact, all three times surprised us. It was three stories that Liz and I hadn't kind of circled as, as kind of the stories that, that we were sniffing around. Um, and I think it also made the episodes, like these episodes are so singular. And I think also um, for a lot of the writers, including ourselves, like finding a sort of personal way in or a real emotional connection to the character or the story, um, felt really, felt really important as well. And I think just to give that freedom to our writers was, was truly exciting. It just is, it's the thing about an anthology that feels exciting as well. Yeah, I mean, I really love the, the connectivity that comes through in every episode. And and Nicole, you know, in, in that realm as well, it sounds like you and, and Bruna Papandrea, who's also produced on the series, were the first two to read the book and really see the potential of this anthology series. And I was interested in how that really shaped your performance, because every episode is tonally so different. And so how helpful was it in terms of just seeing the different voices, the different tones of each episode to really figure out what the unique identity of your episode and your performance was going to be in that realm? I mean, I think I was, I can relate to most of the stories in there or I can feel them. Um, so it was more, I put, I, I said to Liz and Carly, I said, which ones do you feel um, or which one do you think is most suited to me? And, um, and they came back with the photographs and, um, and, and I think that's part of my, the way I um, work is I'm, I'm, very, I love to be molded and I love to be steered. I, my own desires and my own way of seeing myself, I try to take that out so that I'm always going into places that I that are unexpected. Um, but as we talked about the photograph one, I, I suddenly started to go, ah, no, no, these are things that I'm actually feeling going through um, emotionally and therefore can we please set it in Australia. And so that was... Um, so that it just became far more it, deeply personal for me um, and that desire to hold on to everything in the past and the beautiful, those things that are there and being a mother who's having to let go of a child and being the daughter of a mother and having to let go. I mean, there's just so many themes there that I myself am going through. So um, it, that that's what I was drawn to and they were right and I'm glad they pushed me in that direction yeah and they're wonderful they're just 
to you 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 can block your ears both of you but they're so um <laughs> they're just so that well they're so collaborative and they're so um driven to um they, they know how to tell a story but they're also like yeah okay and and can flow and and maneuver within all of the things that were coming at us and this our particular episode we got shut down in australia with covid so um, we had to lose, we lost all our locations pretty much overnight. And um, it was just scrappy kind of filmmaking where you're going, okay. And being able to give Kim Garrig a chance was fantastic because she's um, in her 40s and has never been able to direct a drama or a feature. She's done music videos and commercials, but she hadn't had the opportunity to do that. And that was a big thing to be able to go here. I want you, this is yours. You go make something of it and let's build your career, you know, now that you've got the time. Your kids are growing up a bit and she's got more time to direct. So it was a it was a wonderful thing to be a part of. I really love that. And, and Cynthia, coming over to talking about your episode, I was really interested in, in how you calibrated the emotional element of your character alongside the, the physical representation of what's going on inside of her. Because when we look at kind of those elements that lead into aspects of body horror, it starts as very small bites that would be kind of almost the size of a baby's mouth. And then they become bigger and bigger and more prominent. And your emotional performance is really calibrated alongside that physical manifestation. And so I was interested in how for you, those those two aspects really went hand in hand throughout the episode for you. I think I think as as the the film or well, as the piece goes on, um, th- things start to unravel around her anyway. And so and so I I can't take credit for that. I, I think what helped me calibrate it was was the writing, um, because it's already sort of written that way. That when it becomes out of hand, everything in her life starts to sort of become out of hand. The bites become out of hand until it becomes fever pitch and she can't even, she passes out until it becomes totally out of the scope of her imagination. But that's what happens within her life. Things just start becoming, um, they're just too hard to, to, for her to fix. It's like trying to put a plaster on something that and it won't stick. And that's what sort of happens with Ambia. She can't fix the things that she would normally be able to fix anymore. And I think that those bites are sort of a representation of not being able to, to do that, not being able to be there, not being able to, to fix the things that you can normally fix, not being able to get her daughter to feel okay with her being out and then coming back and then feeling guilty. And then and the next night, not being able to be there. And then her child has, gets a fever and she's not there and doesn't pick up the phone. Well, the one time she decides to have like a night for herself, everything goes wrong. Of course it would. And it just keeps happening that way. And then as that happens, those bites just sort of follow suit. Um, and so it was easy to, to calibrate how I was feeling and, uh, and the emotional journey of it because it was sort of written that way for me, really. And, and, and I'm, I was lucky. I, I just did the job that was in front of me. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and Alison, with your episode, it's such a fascinating acting exercise because you have to be so in tune with your scene partners to the point of delivering dialogue that it's, that's in response to what they're saying, never stepping over their lines, and also giving so many aspects emotionally, but not getting any response and any feedback. And so since you couldn't feed directly off of your scene partners in the same way, but still had to be so in tune when it came to the rhythm, what were the really unique aspects or different ways that you had to approach film? most of those scenes well you're right on a on a literal level uh the challenges that I was facing as an actor are very similar to what the character is going through not being seen or heard and me sort of yeah just having to really raise my voice above the male voices who were speaking over me and trying to get you know use different tactics to try to get their attention which is something that Liz and Carly and I talked about uh, uh, on a character level, at, at, at the script level, in terms of the different tactics that this ghost might try to use, the things that she would try to do when she was human. Um, but was the things that were really fun about this episode and this character that the way that Liz and Carly write, there's just yes. so many juicy levels to what's going on. You know, there are sort of global themes about 
the tropes of the detective show and the dead girl's role within that show and how are we going to flip that on its head um, and statements about violence against women and things like that. And then there's the more microscopic character level stuff about a woman who is hearing what people think about her, you know, when they don't know that she's in the room and, and her sort of having to uh, reconcile the way she saw herself versus the way that other people see her. And mm -hmm. uh, as a woman who's constantly examining my own narcissism and need for male attention, I think that was something that I could connect to. Uh, and it made it really fun to sort of play all these different levels of this character. Like she does have a real important need to be seen and heard, but at the same time, she's kind of examining what kind of woman she is and was and how even after death, she can sort of start anew. She can sort of challenge the stereotypes that people had about her because of the way that she does her hair and makeup and she can set her mind to something and follow through on it. So there was just so much juicy stuff to play with. I'm you know, gonna jump in to say what I think is very, it's, it's very flattering that you guys are all saying the scripts are obviously perfect and ready made to go. Um, but what's funny about Ali's episode is we had so many, we had so many production challenges in almost all the other episodes. And when we got to Ali's, I remember Liz and I thinking like, oh, maybe we'll have a break here. Like this will be the episode that like, she's a ghost. Like we have certain things to figure out, but like this one feels, this is going to be like our vacation on some level. It felt, it, felt, yeah, it felt a little <laughs> bit more straightforward. Like we could, yeah, like we, we, had a, we had a better shot. And then literally the first scene, um, right? Like Allie did the first scene and then like Liz, Allie, Anya, the director and I like had to just say like, can we just all pause for a second? Like that didn't work. Yeah, it was interesting. You're right. Because to read it on the page, the way you read a story and you can have all the voices going at once and you can very clearly see what's going on. And then the logistics of figuring it out were, it felt like, um, it felt like rehearsal, like a theater exercise. And yeah, and, and that is, again, to, to speak to how collaborative Liz and Carly are, um, you know, like Nicole was saying, it was, they're like, everyone was willing to be like, let's pause, let's all huddle up. Let's hear everybody's ideas. How should we go about this? And you know what? Let's experiment a little and try some different things. And it's a really exciting way to work because then once we'd like, how do, everybody, what if everyone talks at the same time simultaneously, which is not something I've ever done in television before. <laughs> and, uh, and it became really exciting when we started yeah. to feel like, oh, this is it. This is the episode. Mm -hmm. And everybody was so game. And it's just like, those are the moments that are the most fun. Yeah, we, I mean, we had a very game group of actors to say, everybody here and then some. And I feel like also we had a crew that was willing to like try to help us pull off each magic trick in mm -hmm. a different way. And we leaned on, you know, different departments for different episodes. So mm -hmm. like for Allie's, our sound department was really, you know, in the ship with us. We were like, Jeff, we're going to record it three different ways and we're just going <laughs> to figure this out. And it was, and you know, with, um, with Cynthia's episode, it was the intensity of that, you know, of that makeup mm. every single day. And that was a character in the story. So I feel like in, in sort of building these eight episodes and these eight magic tricks, that was, you know, it was, everyone was so game and on board to get on that roller coaster every time. You know, and, and speaking of, of having to be very on board for a lot of the tonality, Merit, your performance is, is really remarkable. Again, when you kind of step back and look at what you had to do in terms of literally performing alongside ducks that were there physically within scenes and create this incredibly grounded emotional resonance alongside that. And I was interested in how the preparation process and being able to have rehearsals with Justin Kirk, who voices Larry the Duck and having him move around in the scenes with you really helped you to bring a lot of those grounded elements when it came to the emotional trajectory for your character, because we have to fully buy into both the romanticism and the fall apart of this relationship. Right. right. Um, I was really lucky that um, Justin Kirk, who um, voiced the Duck, was there every day scene after scene, take after take, um, just off a camera out of my eyesight, playing each and every scene, take after take with me. Um, so I would be acting with the live duck in front of me 
um, and then hearing him and working with him. And it ended up being, um, I thought it was going to be the challenge of the episode, the hardest thing that I'd be working with a live animal and maybe we'd be, we'd, you know, I'd steal, you know, a couple of lines here and there, but I'd mostly be working with a piece of tape. And instead, you know, I ended up getting to play almost every scene with two very um, potent points of aliveness, you know? I mean, Justin was acting with me every single take. I didn't know what the scene was gonna be like here, and I didn't know what it was gonna be like here in front of me. Um, and that ended up being really fun and um, uh, alive, I think. I didn't realize it while I was doing it. And it's kind of one of those things where you learn sometimes during press uh, about something that you did a year ago that you didn't understand or know because nobody made you verbalize it. But I think, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to do it and one of the reasons I even liked working that way was that like, um, you know, whenever you get material, your job is to take something that's not real and make it real for yourself and therefore for other people. And in these episodes, um, it kind of heightens or elevates or brings into focus like what our job is every time we go to job. You know, uh, like my job is always to believe the thing that I'm given. Um, and this time I'm given something that is like stereotypically unbelievable or less believable. Um, and I liked that my job was to make it absolutely as honest as possible and mm. to be able to buy every second of, it, second of it for myself so that hopefully the people watching could believe it and then kind of take the story from there. Jesus. I believed it. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say, I really loved doing this project. Like, again, you know, as Marit say, saying, you know, when you come away from something, within the moment, you know, you know it feels good. But when you step away from something, you're far enough away from it to sort of look back at what the experience was. And then you have other experiences along the way. You then sort of have this sort of wonderful hindsight. And, and more and more every day as, I, as I'm further away from, from the, the first day of shooting the episode, I realized I had a really wonderful time and I loved shooting this. I loved doing this project. It was unlike anything and still is unlike anything I have ever done. And, and um, I, I just, I just wanted to say that because I, I don't think we, we, sometimes we forget to be like, I really liked this thing that yeah. we did. And, yeah. and I, I just, I just wanted to like, thank the two of you for, for thinking of us and, and having us be a part of, of this journey because it was really remarkable. Mm. Yeah. So nice. I mean, it was, that's, first of all, that's so kind. And also it's just like, it is that thing of looking back. It's like, oh, it's like we got to make eight. I don't know if they felt like plays or like movies. Or like, they, they didn't, like, they didn't feel like anything we'd ever done either. And it's that was just like lab yeah. school or something. Yeah. Like we went to some <laughs> experimental laboratory thing eight times with. Which you don't, which you don't get to do. I mean, frankly, like, that's off to Apple for letting us. Yeah. Do, like we made an experiment. How did it go <laughs> with all of your money? It's sort of um, good. But it was, but it was, it's so joy. It was so joyful. And it, it felt like you were on a tightrope every day, but doing something very human with incredible people. I mean, like that's sort of the dream of making art is that it doesn't feel like everything you've done before and like nothing since. And, you know, but like not to put you on the spot, Nicole, but like, I, a lot of the answer is like there's someone here on the producing side who like went to bat for it very early and hard and like carried that torch for sure like this this project is an insane it's a weird project like well we can say it like these are all very smart kind of weird women um and it's a kind of weird project and um it's it's always a boulder to to kind of push these you know yeah we had to i mean i think that was the when you approach it as going, we need to be still given as much as TV and streaming and all of these things, you've still got to have the chance to experiment. Mm -hmm. um, you've still got to have the chance to move the, um, things forward to give people chance. I think that's probably what all of us are here for is also the allyship, being able to go, okay, who can we help? 
to have them develop their talent, push their talent. Um, and everyone who signed on was like, I want to help the experiment because that's, I think, something that can get lost. And because a lot of times there's algorithms and all these things that you have to hit to get things made and we're not going to. And so I think that's where Apple went. Yeah, we're just going to let you um, go and and treat it like it's independent filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And yes, they're little, um, they're, they're 20, 25 minutes. So it's not an hour, but it's still an enormous amount of money to be given to kind of experiment with and play with. And it was a big learning process. If we get to do another season, it would be like, we want to push the envelope even more mm -hmm. because you kind of learn and you go where and keep these voices. And, you know, all the women here who just went, we're in, let's go. We'll show up. Yeah. Like COVID or all the things that are going on doesn't matter. That is, I think that's the commitment to each other and to the other people out in the world who are, we're trying to find and go, you, you can have an opportunity here and we'll show up for you. So it's cool, you know, and it's great to be given that and to be able to sometimes use whatever, whatever power you have at whatever minute it's given to you to kind of pass it on, you know. It is. And, and coming back to you, Alison, you know, with one of the other aspects of your performance is the, the physicality of this role as well, because I felt mm. like you the physicality both as kind of an emotional <laughs> expression, but also for a lot of the comedic spaces and a lot of the motions that you make get bigger and bigger, the more frustrated she gets with nobody being able to hear her. And so you really, really lean into those elements. And so I just wanted to ask a little bit about finding that aspect of your performance for the episode. Well, was just doing it on the fly, I guess. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I gotta bring it always back to Liz and Carly and why it's so wonderful. You know, what Cynthia was saying about how this was just the best job, it really was. And I love Liz and Carly so much. And I love working with them so much because I, I have a deep trust for them. And mm -hmm. that is like the actor's dream because then the whole space becomes really safe for me to take some big swings. And I sort of know like, they'll pull me back if that's too crazy. Like, I'm not gonna feel embarrassed to fall on my face here. In fact, you know, and the way that this character was written and even the way that she looked, you know, I always feel like I learn a lot uh, after getting into wardrobe and, going through the process with hair and makeup and kind of seeing what everybody's vision is for this woman and what she looks like. And, you know, the spray tan alone, I was like, oh, she's a little different than characters that I've played before. And how far, like you, like we've said, every episode is so different and the genre of every episode is so different. And so it was sort of like the same thing we're talking about day one of like, even how big am I gonna go as a character but let me make sure to keep it always grounded. And again, it was so juicy, like getting to flip back and forth, which is something that we always got to do in Glow was have some really big, fun, mm -hmm. physical, comedic moments that were grounded in the truth of the character, the truth of the story that we were telling. And when you have that grounded through line throughout the whole episode, I feel like then you're able to go to these silly places, but the emotions that are going on with the character never leave that truthful place. And so you can kind of snap right back to these more serious moments, I guess. Absolutely. You know, and, and to that point as well, Cynthia, you know, I love hearing you describe how working on this as well, that one of the things that you really loved was getting to play into the comedic space. And, you know, even just having that scene at the very end where there's real lightness and, and that moment character makes the emotional moment of her unleashing everything and finally saying these things out loud even more resonant and so how did having the comedic space to play into really allow you to add even more textures to a lot of the deeper emotional scenes as well you know when as human beings when we tend to I, I always you know when you're when you're trying to find your way towards the, the, your honesty, we often sort of navigate our way through comedy to get there um, because it's the easiest way to deal with what's coming at us. And often I'm not given the chance to 
play in the space of comedy because I feel like it's really complex. And sort of like, how do I laugh off the things that are really desperately terrible right now, but I'll make it, it'll be fine. I'll, I'll be okay. And to then navigate my way through that to, to a real moment of, of clarity and, and heartbreak and sadness to then find my way out into light again. It's just a really beautiful um, journey to be able to take. And I, I found it thrilling because I don't get to do it very often. Um, and it, it made me flex my chops a little bit because I, I don't get to play in the comedy space a lot. And, and I would do it again in a heartbeat because it felt really good to n- navigate that sort of um, journey of emotion through light and dark, which is often when it becomes the most interesting to watch when someone is able to to bat between uh, the lightness and the darkness that we have as human beings of humanity anyway, um, to find them uh, trying to figure out where they actually sit within all of it. Um, And it was just fun to play. It was really fun to be a part of. And it was fun to play with everyone on set and fun to play with my kid who, bless her heart, worked so hard. She's only, was she in six at that point? She was only six and she was just, she was trying her best. And even that was like the only way to really like connect, to get her to connect was, was lightness. It was comedy with her. You had to make her laugh for her to want to be there. And so it meant, it meant that in reality and, and on this, in this piece, both of those things were really important to, to keep the, the piece flowing in the right way. Yeah. I, I loved it. And Rashida did such a great job. I love Rashida. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's like my big sister. I love her. <laughs> yeah, you so can tell. I was very glad that. Very good. Uh, yeah. yeah. She did it. And on the flip side of that, Merit, you know, your performance was almost not playing into what could have been a comedic aspect, but it felt like that worked so well because there was that acknowledgement of what this dynamic is of a woman talking to a duck when the duck first approaches her. And mm-hmm. so did you did you kind of find what the essence of that first meeting and that first conversation needed to be and, and kind of very quietly acknowledging what it is so that you could take it to all of those emotional spaces later? Or did you f- try a few different possible directions when you were filming that scene? I don't know. I actually wish that I could redo that scene. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know that we, I can't remember what was happening that day. It was a big day, it was a tough day, but all of, I think all of us could say like on our episodes every single day, it's a big day, it was a tough day. Um, but to boringly and honestly answer your question, I don't think that I, I think this character or I as an actor move on very quickly from the fact that I'm talking to a duck. I, I did not, uh, want to play, you know, a 30 minute episode and every second Mm. being like, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. it. It very quickly is not a duck. I think that, um, that's part of what makes the episode uh, valuable. Yeah, I don't know if I actually answered your question. You know what I was thinking about (laughs) on my way here? Um, I don't know why, but like what popped into my mind was like, uh, I was kind of going over the answers to questions that might be asked. And one of them that popped to mind that I think I had been asked a couple of times two months ago was like, oh, why is it important to tell these female stories? You know, why is it valuable? to?" And like, I had this response in myself where I was like, I really hope that doesn't get asked. Like, I don't know how to like, I don't know, there's a time and a place for everything. And I know that I am able and capable of answering that sometimes. But but for some reason today, I was just like, man, I really hope I'm not asked to like validate my presence, (laughs) you Mm. know? like to validate, you know, my presence, our presence, the fact that we're telling stories about women or stories in, in, in this way, the way that I think we were just, other people were speaking to a while ago. Um, and I was really glad that that wasn't asked. It made me think of comedians who start saying like, I can't answer, what do you say to people who say women aren't funny anymore? So I don't know, I just wanted to share that came to mind today. I just did not want to have to yeah. update our presence yet again in a sound bite. Something about today, I just was like, I don't think I'll be able to do it. And nobody asked me to, and yet I still wanted to offer that I didn't want to have to. And I'm glad that I wasn't asked to. And I, I think that's it. great. I think once I was asked that question and just said no. <laughs> They're like, well, what do you what does it mean to be a woman telling stories? And I was just like, no, no. Mm. 
And I couldn't think of anything else to say, but it was the most genuine thing I felt at the time. And it totally threw off and I felt terrible, but I was also like, no, I don't really actually feel that. Mm. That's what I felt. I'm going to use that answer from now. But I think what's interesting is the, as to to really um, say, is the experimentation of it. Mm -hmm. Because I, male, female, any gender that you're talking about, that we're not given the chance to experiment that Mm -hmm. often. Um, And that's that's tough now. And and to put magical realism on screen, um, you know, that probably doesn't fit into Apple's algorithm. Am I right, Apple? (laughs) But, um, But that's okay because there is people when you get on the phone and you go, please, I am begging you to make this. Mm-hmm. Um, then, and they respond and they actually hear the passion and they go, okay. And they're the people we have to support, mm-hmm. being the executives as well who are operating, be they whatever gender they are, please help us to keep trying to put things that aren't necessarily fitting into what we're meant to be doing. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the fun stuff. And I'll always keep trying to, um, you know, and build our auteurs now as well because we don't allow our auteurs to flourish. Um, they just sort of get, no, 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 diluted very quickly. So it's the, the idea of building auteurs as well is really important. Um, and... That's what I think everyone sitting here and then who wasn't able to show up today it was in support of. Mm-hmm. It is. And, and I'm sorry to speak for all of you. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> With that element of magical realism that you're talking about there, Nicole, it's, yeah. it's the complexities that you all bring to those moments and the way that these stories are told that, that really resonates in watching them. And, and for your performance in particular, those moments with the photographs, there's so many layers to what those instances are. And what's interesting is that they're very fleeting moments. It's not that she lives in these memories when she consumes a photograph for a really long time. It's gone in a flicker of seconds, you know, and that's what really feeds that very specific hunger for connectivity and emotion that she's not getting in her real life. And, you know, well, to keep them, to keep them inside. And then ultimately they are just a part of you and they are fleeting and memory is memory. But I think that's what it represents is I, I want to go back or I want to hold on to or I don't want to let go or I want to make a part of me. And I think the essence of that is they're already a part of you, you know, but the desire to keep going into, and I definitely have that. I look at um, photographs and I literally, my heart goes, oh, I need that. I need that moment again. Please give me that moment. It can make me cry. But I just love that we were sitting, I was sitting in a cubicle that we'd built. It, was a, it wasn't a real, <laughs> and the, the bathroom and like devouring these photos. And at one point I devoured 50 of them in a row because I was just so into it. And I did paper, I did marzipan, I did all these different flavors that they had. And my whole mouth was all chafed and I went, oh, I might have to hold back a bit because (laughs) I'm going to be all scabbed up and we've only got five days and we've got to get. And I was like, so I may not be able to stuff them in as quickly and as and for 20 days, you know, (laughs) because I was like so into it. Um, But I just love that there was a whole that there was that kind of weird sensation. And the first time I did it, I'm like, does that work? (laughs) And you were like, yeah, it works. I'm like, okay, well, I'll just keep at it. And the sublime Judy Davis was there um, and she gave us notes and came up with ideas and she's just, I mean, she's a goddess, that woman. And as an actress, I grew up watching her. So to be sitting in in a van with her driving her around, I was very, very honored. I bow down <laughs> to the to the glory of her because she really is one of the greats. Miss Judy. Yeah, she's like whew. so. 
She is. And Liz and Carly, you know, what? one of the things that I love is that every single episode has its own unique voice, its own unique tone. And also when you step away from each episode, it resonates in a very different way. You know, there's a different emotion that we leave Merit's episode from when she's like, I don't need a nice doctor. I am the nice doctor to, you know, <laughs> out there, you know having some sort of closure, but there's not a closure on the theme that you're exploring within that episode. And so when you were working with the, with, with the rest of the writers and the directors, how did you kind of approach those conversations of not just what what is the tone of this episode, but what's the intentionality with how we want the audience to leave and the discourse that we want them to have either emotionally or literally with themselves after watching? Um. Hmm. I mean, I think the biggest compliment we get about the show is hearing all the different kind of arguments people have after watching the episodes and disagreements. And, you know, I think we usually circle shelf in particular as one where I feel like a lot of people who didn't agree with her decision or didn't understand her decision, um, we definitely intended to provoke thought, provoke conversation. Um, but then, you know, in, we still have to make choices, especially when you're, you know, both, both at the writing phase and at the, at the production phase. So a lot of what we were, were kind of aiming to do was to discreetly look at what, what each episode was trying to do um, and see whether an open-ended ending or a kind of finer point would do the job of kind of, um, I don't know how else to say it. It's like certain certain fables needed to kind of have the beginning, middle, end in order for us to present you something to react to, and others needed to end more with with an, with a question. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of came from, um, you know, even just looking at the women here. You know, photographs on some level. I always joke with Liz. I'm like, it's a no brainer. Who wouldn't eat the photographs? Like, we don't need to ask the question to the audience. Like, would you eat the photographs? everyone would eat the photographs. It's like a human impulse. Um, so we didn't really have a, a question to ask there. So we, you know, we had a kind of an ending that felt a bit more closed emotionally for the container because there's still a lot of problems. Um, mm. but I think, you know, looking now at like Ali and Cynthia's, I feel like there's a there's closure but you're kind of like i don't know what's going to happen next i don't know whether um i don't know whether ampi is going to qu quit her job or make any changes she seems she seems to have accepted something but i kind of you know liz and i didn't want to give you an answer that was like so the solution is for women you know you can have it all if you just accept that it's difficult <laughs> i don't know if, if ampi will be okay um you know ali's dead <laughs> i don't know what's happening next <laughs> I think it's like, and I think we also solved like, a murder. We provoked, we asked some, some questions at the end that we really, oh, sorry, Liz. I think both me and the internet. No, I was just going to say, there are things. That, yeah, no, I think like the get in Cynthia's episode in particular, we talked about, because um, we had actually shot a scene that actually put a fine point on it. And we're like, oh, then actually the guilt continues. Yeah. The story kind of goes on. So, feels like you want to wrap it up enough but leave it open to enough conversation that you know we're not we're not closing this chapter for this woman or all women we're just telling this story yeah. and life will continue after well, I really loved what you all did in, in terms of telling each of these individual stories and, and everything that sits with you after watching each of these episodes. I'm so glad that it wasn't a show that was created for algorithms, but really came from such a personal place for all of you. So thank you so much for talking all about it today. Really, really appreciate all of your time. Thanks, <laughs> thank you.